Welcome to the long and short maestro here. Thank you for tuning in every day on this channel. We try to make you a better crypto trader by showing you smart money, price action trading techniques from a long and short term perspective. Doesn't matter if you're a long term trader, short term trader. We have some tricks up the sleeve for you. This is the fourth installment, just the second part of the fourth installment of our current series and tutorial how to be a successful trader in cryptocurrency. Thank you guys for tuning in. Let's go ahead and get right into it. So before you start trading, there's some things that you need to make sure of. You need to make sure you're ready. Mentally, emotionally, physically, spiritually. You want to make sure that you're ready on all of these different levels before you start to push those buttons. And I'm sure you guys hear me preach this all of the time, right? Just understanding where you are emotionally is what's going to help you survive in the game of trading. Controlling those emotions is really the key to it all. You also want to make sure that you do have some practice under your belt. You do have a demo account set up, paper trading account set up, and you're winning at least 55 to 60% of those trades. To me, it makes no sense for you to dive into a live money market, trading on leverage at that, without at least <laughs> having some practice under your belt. Now, when it comes to investing and things of that nature, right, longer term trades, that's not necessarily the best option for you, right? But if you're swing trading, if you're scalping, you should definitely practice those techniques on those smaller time frames, on those demo accounts before you dedicate any real live money to any type of leverage trading. And that's a rule that we follow. If I ever mentor anybody in this you know, community, that will be what I impose upon you. You have to put yourself in a winning position before you go live and if you're not able to do that then you just don't go live folks it's about preserving capital not losing it funds are allocated right you got to have the funds to do it and your first set of funds when you're first going into the market these should not be things that you are relying on to pay your rent to feed your family to pay your bills this is money that you're bringing into the market that is easily disposable. This was the money from the pair of sneakers you were going to buy this month, but you chose to sacrifice it to get into the market. This is the money that you were going to use to take that girl out, but she stiffed you. So now you're going to use it to allocate it to the market. You guys get what I'm saying? None of these funds that you first put in should be important to you in any real world way. If you get what I'm saying, if you do that, then you're not going to be hurt if you take a loss and you blow your account. Set the proper expectations for yourself and the market. That's first and foremost. OK, have a firm understanding of what type of trader you are. These are things that we covered in the previous lesson and the recommended starting approach for scalpers. You want to start small, as we stated before, test the waters, especially when it comes to leverage. If you're not sure on how to trade with leverage, don't do it right off the bat. Start with very small leverage right off the bat, right? And all leverage is, it's just multiplying whatever money you're initially bringing into the trade. It's multiplying it by that amount. The easiest way for you to blow an account is use high leverage. Until you're aware of what you're really doing in the market, this is an easy way for you to lose. For swing traders and positional traders, you want to scale into and out of positions. Nobody should ever drop a full bag, all of your money, life savings on any position for a long-term trade, <laughs> all right? Guys, the market is not moving that way for us to be making these type of moves right now. Now, there are times and places where that could actually be successful, but right now isn't the time. Not only is it important for you to understand where you want to get in, where you want to get out, but it's also important to understand the market conditions that you're in before you jump into a trade. You can set up alerts, predefined levels for limit orders to automate your entries and exits, which we're going to talk about in this tutorial. And if you're actually placing market orders, you don't want to just come to the chart and say, I'm investing today, so let's buy something. That, that's the wrong way to go. All right, You want to be patient when you're placing your market orders in the market. So the first part when it comes down to trading is actually finding an exchange. Now, a lot of people overcomplicate this when it comes to finding an exchange. What should I be on? Where's the coin that I want, right? Sometimes you have to do a little research, but there are no defined rules on where you should buy, sell, and hold cryptocurrency. There are some rules that we lay out for ourselves, but there's no real guidance in regards to where you should buy, where you should sell, right? But there are some tips that we like to give. We'll talk about those in a second. It's best to diversify your funds and use exchanges based on your style of trading. So for example, I like to separate my funds and my crypto into two different accounts, basically. 
One is a holder account, right? And that's Coinbase, Coinbase Pro, something like Binance US, Crypto.com, a hard wallet. These are options for holder accounts. When it comes to leverage trading accounts, I'm really only using two sites. The first is Bybit, the second is Femex. Why? Because I can trade on leverage on these and it's a bit different than Coinbase and even Coinbase Pro where I'm not able to use that leverage aspect when it comes to my trading. So I break it out in two different ways and this is the best way that I approach the market when it comes to trading different variables and, and strategies in the market. All right, moving on. So when it comes down to picking exchanges, here are some rules that I like to follow. I want to stay away from brand new exchanges. Anything that's brand new on the market hasn't really proved itself. These are the ones that have the least amount of liquidity and the highest chance of getting hacked. You want something that's been around for a while and has a lot of different security measures in place as you sign up for these particular exchanges. You always want to make sure that you're using some sort of multi-factor authentication to identify that you are the person signing into your account. All right. The easiest way for you to give other people access to your account is to not use multi-factor authentication. You can get fished very easily and then, you know, can basically get into your account, wipe you out of whatever you just invested there. All right, so be aware there. Become familiar with the exchanges and the process of moving money to and from the exchange, right? So transferring money in crypto, whether it's Bitcoin, Ethereum, whatever it may be, it's a process that you have to get used to, right? Usually when we transfer something from bank to bank or say cash app to a bank, it's pretty instant. Bitcoin, not so much, right? It's going to take a little time for your actual funds to go into your Bitcoin wallet, your Ethereum wallet, depending on whatever crypto you're, you're currently transacting, right? XRP, something like that's pretty immediate. But depending on the crypto, it's going to take a little while for your transaction to go through. So you want to become familiar with that, right? It's always a little weird when you first buy some Bitcoin because you bought it, but nothing's there. Right. So just be aware of how these exchanges work, the time periods that it may take for your accounts to come up to date. Also want to diversify between your exchanges. For example, we use Coinbase and a hardware wallet for holding. This is like our cold storage wallets, right? Coinbase itself and an external hardware wallet. Right. We, would, we do want to hold some ex, some crypto externally. So we bought the hardware wallet for that. Coinbase Pro and Femex to some degree we use for active spot trading, right? So these are for things like scaling in, scaling out. We want to get in and out of positions relatively quickly. We don't want to pay a lot of fees to do it. Coinbase Pro, Femex, two really good sites to do that. And then I can also use Femex for scalp trading or leverage trading, right? Along with Bybit, which are pro probably my two main sites that I visit in order to do any type of leverage trading, all right? So I have money broken up between both of them. I don't have it all on Bybit or Femex, okay? So spreading your wealth around a little bit is the best way to go when it comes to these exchanges. And the easiest way to do it is just to break it out depending on what you're actually trying to achieve, different sources or, or exchanges for different methods and trading that I'm doing, right? So all of my scaling in, scaling out swing trades, Coinbase Pro. Long-term plays, the holders, right? Those are the ones that I'm putting in my cold wallet. And any scalping, leverage trading that I'm doing, I'm doing it on Bybit and Femex. You want to create an easy access method to pull up all of these web pages at the same time. So one thing that I found very helpful is just clicking on something like Freeze tab, right? Which is a Chrome extension or bookmarking everything, right? Or sort of pinning these websites to whenever you open your browser. These things help you just pull up your trade account very fast, make moves very fast if in fact you see something in the market that you want to take advantage of. All right, so these are all helpful tips and some rules that I follow when it comes down to picking exchanges. All right, if you guys aren't aware already, I am a price action trader and I believe that price action is king. So one tip that I always like to give folks is watching price action is what really makes the difference in your trading. All right, now some people aren't price action traders. They just sort of watch levels and pay attention to those levels specifically or whether or not their chart pattern is breaking out in the way that they think it should, okay? Everyone has their own method. But to us, the most efficient way for you to really understand what's happening with price is to watch it on a pretty consistent basis. Now, the most efficient way to become familiar with how price is gonna move in any particular crypto is to watch it. If I'm trading Bitcoin, 
I want to watch Bitcoin. If I'm watching Ethereum, then I'm trading Ethereum. If I'm watching Doge, then I'm trading Doge. You have to be able to sit there and watch your particular asset, whatever you're trading the most, you want to view it on a consistent basis. This is how you develop a quote unquote feel for price and what it may do next. You cannot develop your gut feeling for how price is going to move unless you're watching it regularly almost like a television show, almost like you're binge watching Netflix, right? I binge watch price. And this is why we're able to just pick sort of the right times and areas to do things because watching price action is gonna help you identify a number of different things. The most active hours of the market, if you're watching the market all the time, you'll know when it moves. Repeating patterns in market structure, you'll be able to see these as they start to get drawn out in price, especially ranges. Characteristics and volatility and price movement, again, this kind of harkens back to the time in the market. What time does the market become volatile? When is it quiet? When does it move the most? When does it move the least? These are all things that you can get from watching price action. And here's some tips. Set up a dedicated screen. If you're not able to do this, then you want to record your price action and watch a playback of it. There's a lot of different recording softwares that you can use nowadays. Just make a video recording. But you want to do it at the time that you would be playing the market, right? So if you can only trade at certain hours of the day, say New York session, for example, you don't want to necessarily be watching what's happening in Asia. You want to watch a few hours before the New York session, all the way through to a few hours after the New York session so that you understand how price moves within that time window, if that's what you're trading, right? So you don't have to have a 24 hour focus like I do. You can just focus on a very small time in price. Think about it like this. I'm going to trade before the lunch hour in New York. I need to understand how price moves from the 10 a.m. hour to the 12 a.m. hour only and study that. But somehow, some way, you have to figure out how you can watch price action, how you can dive a little bit deeper into what's actually happening with price. And then that way, you'll be able to make really, really, really good decisions off of your feeling on what's gonna happen in the market and not always have to focus on things that are happening on your charts. Now, let's talk about the different types of orders that we're gonna to explain to you guys and show you guys once we dive into some of our deeper tutorials here, right? But just pushing the button is what we like to call the initiation of your first market order. Now, there's a difference in market orders and limit orders. Basically, market orders, you're pushing the button to execute when you wanna get in and out of the market. Limit orders, you're sort of setting a level, waiting for price to reach that level, and it automatically puts you into the market, right? Which is why we talk about automating your process with limit orders. So, your first few trades, if you're pushing the button for market orders, are gonna be your hardest trades that you're gonna ever take. The first real learning experience in the market is when you push that button for the first time. You see how trading works, you get the emotional swings that all start to play out, and you see your strategies at play in the market. And you understand how your emotions will affect your strategy as time goes on and as that play continues. So these experiences should be journaled. You should be writing all of this stuff down, or at least trying to capture it in the best way you can during your first few trades as a trader. These are going to be things that you're going to look back on after you gain some experience and sort of laugh at yourself to say, yeah, I get why I was making this mistake now. I understand why things didn't work on that particular trade, but you won't have that context unless you write it down. Pushing the button will become easier over time. This is just something that happens. You start to have that paradigm shift and things start to get a lot easier in the market. Learning to wait for your desired conditions will be the hardest learning curve objective. Meaning, if you're executing market orders and you're coming to the chart and you're pushing that button, you're going to be anxious to push that button, especially if you've won some trades. Whenever you're first looking at a chart, whenever you're first analyzing the chart, unless something's screaming at you, your first instinct isn't to push the trade button. It's to look at what the atmosphere is giving you. What is the environment giving you first? Then push the button. So don't be anxious. You know, you can take tons of market orders in a day and definitely run up that commission for sure. Experience is gonna breed your confidence for you. Establishing a real method of analysis and building a directional bias before taking a trade is really all that matters. So once you get your process down, once you understand how you bring your bias into the market, you're gonna be able to push that button a lot easier. 
Whether or not you're able to control your emotions at that point, I think that's the hardest battle of them all. But just getting that method down is gonna make that button a lot easier to push. Also establishing a feeling around every trade, entry and exit. Once you start to get that good, your patience is gonna to start to become your virtue. That feeling is gonna tell you to wait instead of get in, get in, get in. And that's when you're starting to sort of turn that corner in regards to good trading versus bad trading, in regards to decisions that you're making as a good trader versus a bad trader. And your emotional reactions to price movements will begin to lessen. You won't get as mad if you lose. You won't get as excited if you win. You won't go into the trade with any type of emotional investment. It's all gonna be neutral. This is the curve that you wanna turn if you're gonna be a successful trader. Your emotional reactions to trade outcomes lessen in duration as well. So even if you do get a bit emotional on a trade, it's only gonna be for a couple of minutes. Whereas before, if you lost $5 in your account, you were throwing your computer across the room. Complete difference, right? And I'm guilty of that, which is why I can say it. But these are the things that are gonna to start to happen to you once you start to round that corner. Exiting positions, Taking profits becomes a lot easier to do, okay? So sometimes just taking your profits is hard to do because you think price is just gonna keep running and running and running in your favor. And sometimes you get wrecked doing that, right? So exiting when you're supposed to, taking your profits when you're supposed to based on your rules is also going to become a lot easier for you to do once you start to gain some experience. Now, limit orders. This is how we're going to automate the entry and exit points for our trades all right now remember those markups that we drew out in the first couple of videos that we put up okay if you've marked up your chart for discount premium scale in scale out positions you can set up limit orders and alerts based on those particular levels so we weren't just marking up the chart to mark it up we were marking up the chart to say okay if this is the level that we want to get in at let's set a limit order there and then let's go and set a limit order or a take profit level for where we want to get out of that trade. And once we do that, we've essentially automated our system, right? So we're gonna reference trading view to set up the limit orders on our desired exchange. This method is only recommended for swing trades and positional trades, right? Sort of set it and forget it. You can do that because you're working on a longer time frame to where you can automate things. But if we're scalping, we're involved. We're watching the charts, we're there, we're at the table, okay? You also wanna be sure to check your market conditions as price gets near your levels. For example, if we set up a, a area to scale in or if we think we're gonna buy when price reaches a discount, if we're going into a bear market, that may not be the best play to make, right? So we can draw the level, but it has to make sense for us to take the trade at that level based on the market conditions that we're in. And scalping positions are best played via the market orders or limit orders you can watch as they get executed. So as we just stated before, if you're gonna do anything in regards to scalping, you wanna make sure you're able to sit there at the charts as things happen. Now, keeping track. Good traders, we keep journals, all right? The purpose of journaling is to capture the trade variables to reflect on success and failures. What did you do? in that trade? What did you do after the trade? What did you do before the trade? Your journal should help you capture some of this. You can capture your initial hypothesis versus the ultimate outcome, and then try to figure out where things may have went wrong if they did go wrong. And over time, your journal becomes your mentor and your hub for trade information, especially if you're trading the same asset. I trade mostly Bitcoin on leverage. So Everything that I do revolves around Bitcoin. So I'm firmly aware of how that price moves up, down, on the weekend, on Monday, on Tuesday, because I watch it and I journal it. And I'm able to reference that. No books are written that references what I see in the charts, right? So ultimately, this is my mentor when it comes to me making a decision. All of the tendencies and all of the variables that I track in my journal is what helps me. Not necessarily a, you know, what is Bitcoin book, or any other technical analysis that I'm seeing out there, the journal is what is the hub for me when it comes to information. In journal tracking, there's some considerations that you wanna make when it comes to the variables, right? Now we're gonna do a full tutorial on this as well. You'll get a full tutorial on our journal and how we use it and you know the reasons why I put so much into it and what I track there. We're gonna get a full tutorial on it. There's a lot there, right? But these are some of the things that we're looking at. Asset, trade entry, exit, duration, time frame, the session traded, our thoughts, feelings, emotional states before, during, and after the trade, our hypothesis versus the outcome. What did we miss 
What were we thinking that turned to be true and turned out to be false? We're going to take screenshots of the play. We're going to do notations on it. And we're going to give ourselves a grade. How do we do in this trade? And we're not going to be brutal on ourselves, but we're not going to sugarcoat it either. And then we're going to outline what the next steps are for the next trade. The best time for you to think about what you need to do for the next trade is right after your last trade. And you may be telling yourself anything. I need to sit down for two days because I'm on a seven loss losing streak. Or we've won over and over and over again. Remember your basics going into your next trade. The next steps is the one piece that people don't add to their journaling and don't add to their trade recap that I think messes them up for their next trade. You want to know how you're going to approach the market next time based on what you just did. There is a cyclical building effect when it comes to trading. All right, let's get into some limit orders and automating this example. We're going to show you guys exactly how this is done on Coinbase Pro and TradingView. Okay, so we'll take a look at how we do it for our account. And you can apply this to really any other exchange. As long as you're marking up your charts the right way, then you'll be able to apply this method to any exchange that you're trading on as long as they have the ability to place limit orders, which essentially all of them do. Okay, so let's get into it. Okay, guys, so we are now currently on Coinbase Pro. And what we're going to do is set up a limit order on Bitcoin to automate our system. Okay, now we don't have a ton of money in this account to trade with. So we're going to set our limit order for pretty low. But ultimately, what we know is that we want to get in somewhere around our first scale and level around 35 450. Okay, so remember that number 35 450 is the limit order area where we're looking to jump in and we want to get out around 45 515. Okay, so these two numbers are going to be very important as we go in and place these orders. Okay, so we're not going to place anything major. Okay, but what we want to get you guys to focus on is the area where you want to start is in the trade. All right, so we're going to click on trade. It's going to bring up this screen for us here. And the first place that we want to go to is just to click on your asset. All right, and you want to make sure that Coinbase Pro offers your asset. And depending on what you want to trade, you just want to go ahead and click on it. Now, we like to trade USD, right? Because that's the easiest thing to sort of convert back to after the trade. So we're going to make sure that we have Bitcoin selected there. Now, what we're going to do is scroll down a little bit because there's two areas that you want to really pay attention to. The first is what your order is going to be. Okay, so either it's going to be a market order or a limit order, depending on what you have right in your account, you can place a market order to buy a certain amount of Bitcoin for the certain amount of USD that you have in your account. Now, when you're placing a limit order, it's a bit different. And remember, market orders, it's like you're pushing the button. You're pulling the trigger manually. You're doing this manually. Limit orders allow you to automate a bit of what you're doing. So remember that price, 35,450 is where we want to get in. And we just want to double check that. Yep, 35,450 was the number. Okay, so that's the limit price. We're going to type that in, 35,450. Now, once we have 35,450, we always want to check the amount of money that we have in our account. And being that we only have close to a grand in this account, we're only going to bet a very small amount of Bitcoin. So we'll do 0.001. All right. And hopefully that does give us a total order that fits with the number. It does. Okay. So we have $35 order for Bitcoin that's sitting at 35,450. Now, of course, if we were really in a trade, we would bet a little bit more than that. But this is for demonstration's sake. All right. The fee that that's going to cost us is 21 cents. And we can go ahead and place that buy order. Now, what we want to do is sell Bitcoin at one of our take profit levels. So instead of setting the limit order up to buy, we're going to set the limit order up to sell at 45,515. Okay. So let's go back to Coinbase Pro. And we're going to switch it to sell. The limit order will be, again, the 0 0.001 Bitcoin. And the limit price that we want to sell at is at, again, 45,515. Okay. So we'll put that in 45,515. Okay. And at this point, that will be a total of $45.24 USD for a fee of 27 cents and we want to place the sell order. Now we have both a buy and sell order set up. So all we have to do is 
wait, <laughs> essentially, for Bitcoin to hit 35,450. All right, now we have a current position in Bitcoin. So if we hit this sell limit, you know, it's just going to sell that amount of Bitcoin that we currently have in our account. But if you had none, then you would be dependent on Bitcoin hitting this buy level, then hitting this sell level. And as long as it goes in that way, then you'll be successful and you'll actually take that profit home. This is going to be the way that you're able to automate your orders in Coinbase Pro. And you can kind of take this thing and do it the same way in any other exchange. We have our orders set. Let's see what happens and let's see what Bitcoin does to make that happen for us. Hopefully this helped you out, guys. Let's go ahead and dive back into the tutorial. Coming right back around to things here, we're going to talk about the next piece, which is trade management. What are you actually managing in a trade, right? Well, there's your stop loss, and this is either a price level or a period in time that you're going to exit your actual trade. All right, so there is such a thing as time stops as well, right? I'm going to trade until this particular hour, minute, session, and then I'm out of there, right? Because I know what could happen in the next few minutes session, right? There are exits that way. And then most stops are set up by levels in price. And this is what most traders use in order to set up stop losses. You also want to manage where you're taking profits and same exact premise. You can exit off of a level or you can exit off of a period in time where I'm going to take my profit. Also, as you guys already know, you have to manage yourself, your emotions when you're in the trade. How are you reacting to price movement, your anxiety to trade when losing or winning? Managing yourself really is the only way that you're going to be able to control your account. All right. People can take losses and bounce back from that. No problem. People can take losses and kind of get stuck in the weeds and never bounce back from that as well. But the only way that they're able to bounce back is if they're able to control their emotions and then sort of rekindle what they need to in order to become a winning trader again. And this is what we're going to preach to you guys over and over and over again. So here's some tips when it comes down to trade management. You want to use the same criteria for trade entry and exits pretty much all the time. You're essentially trying to exit off of the inverse of the entry, right? So you want to make sure that you're using the same criteria and you're staying on the same time frame when it comes to your entries and your exits. One very classic way that people usually set up, right? And for scalpers, I usually do it this way. I'll start on the one hour, get an idea of the bias, which way the price wants to move. I'll zoom in to the 15 minute to get a better idea of, you know, more of a closer time frame to where I can really time things to enter either on the one minute or the five minute. Now, once I'm entered in, I'm managing that trade on the 15 minute chart. Why? Because it sits right in the middle of the lower time frame and the higher time frame that I'm analyzing both areas, sort of my execution point versus my sort of highest point to watch the bird's eye view per se. And I'm sitting right in the middle of that to manage the trade. And if things swing in either direction on that 15 minute, it gives me a pretty good perspective to say, okay, if things are going bad, let me go back in on my one minute to really tighten, tightly manage this trade and then either exit or stay in the trade based on the conditions I see on the one minute because that's where I entered in the trade, right? You get what I'm saying, guys? The origin of where you start should also be where you finish when it comes to your exit. Manage those trades according to your trading style for sure has to be part of what you're doing for trade management. If I'm a scalper, I'm not going to manage my trade like a long-term trader and vice versa. Okay, so understanding your trading style and how you have to manage it all matters at the end of the day. And then you want to control impulses and emotions. Biggest thing that we've talked about in this entire tutorial is just how to control these impulses and emotions in trading. And the best thing that you can do in order to become a Winning trader from a losing trader is concentrate on this first. We're going to talk about a very sensitive subject at this point, stop losses. Most people don't use stop losses, right? Or sometimes traders don't use them. And it, it, this is the thing. Why should I use a stop loss if institutions can see it? Well, here's the thing, guys. Anyone can see your stop loss if they know where they're placed, okay? Which is usually behind equal highs, equal lows, you know, peaks in price, you're not really able to hide your stop loss as good as you think you're able to. Just essentially because of the way that we're taught and how we place them. So stop losses are going to protect your account from major losses and liquidations. That's why it's important for you to have them. But don't think that the institutions are the only ones that can see your stop loss. I can see them too. 
but it's much harder to climb back from a big loss than a small loss, even if they're multiple small losses. So the point behind this is to say that if I don't put a stop loss on and I lose 25% of my account, that's a lot harder to bounce back from than if I lost 25% of my account over time with very small losses. Because along that way, I'm gonna make some wins too and that 25% loss of my account isn't gonna be as dramatic. Using stop losses in a strategic way is gonna help you maintain your account. It's gonna help you manage the risk, protect your account, this is the only way to stay in the trading game. If you're not using stop losses and protecting your capital, then this is where you get liquidated. This is where you don't come back, right? This is where you blow accounts over and over and over again. No matter what you do, you just keep making the same mistake. And part of it is not using a stop loss. The way that they teach stop losses is pretty ignorant to me. Now, I have my own opinion. You may have your own opinion, but... To us, there's a better way to place a stop loss, but it does take some practice and it does take some skill to do it the proper way. So let's break it down. Stop loss, the normal way, the way that is taught to most traders, it's placed behind the entry point near previous obvious swings in price. If I'm short, I think price is gonna go down. My stop loss is placed above the entry and it's usually placed above, let's say a equal high, a high point in price, Okay, and depending on which time frame you're on, that's a pretty easy level to see for a stop loss. Now, if I'm long, the stop loss is going to be placed below the entry, meaning I'm going to try to find a recent low, maybe on a lower time frame to place that stop loss. And that's a very easy place for price to go to take you out. These places that you're looking for are obvious levels in price action. They're nothing secret. Even if you're on a higher time frame and you think that you can save yourself by placing that stop loss way beyond where you think price may go, all it's gonna take is for price to start to move against you and you're gonna move that stop loss up. Believe me, brother, I've done it before. And eventually it's gonna come to test it. And the reason why is because the market just has a way of finding levels of equal highs, equal lows, previous highs and lows, and it just wants to go there. If you place your stop losses there, of course it's gonna hit it. Now, the thing about a protective stop loss is that it allows for losses in the account as the price moves against your trade. So if I'm placing it behind my entry point, then if price moves against me in any way, shape or form doing any part of that trade, I am down at that point until either the stop loss gets hit or price reverses again and now I'm going back up. But placing stop losses at recent highs and lows in price puts you in the line of fire for these institutional liquidity runs. So if you go into the red, all right, and your stop loss is way behind where you entered, and but it's at an obvious level, chances are it's probably going to get hit. <laughs> okay, so don't place them there. I'm just going to tell you guys again, do not place stop losses at equal highs and lows unless you're forced to do that type of thing. Right, because you do want to protect yourself. If you just get into a trade and price doesn't move in your favor, then you want to place that stop loss in a protective position at one of those equal highs or lows, essentially because you already have an idea that you may get stopped out. Okay, If you want to protect yourself, this is the way you do it. I myself would essentially just exit the trade if it didn't move my direction within a pretty good amount of time. People protect their accounts in many different ways. Sometimes it's just about hitting that button to get out as well. All right. Now your protective stop loss, it should always be placed based on your risk appetite. Always. If you're willing to risk $200 or so in price movement for an $800 move, by all means, this is what you're going to do. But always make sure that it fits your risk profile and you're not taking too much of a loss on any stop loss that you place. And avoid these if possible. This is what we say to folks. And it's a new concept. I'm not sure how many people place their stops the way that we show how to place them. But, you know, we'll give an example of what it is here. This is our preferred method. All right. Now, it's called a win lock stop loss. There may be different names for it. There may be a different person who's discovered this that I'm just not aware of. But for the most part, this is the way that we have started to trade. And this is why we're able to maintain a high win percentage and not take losses. Because once the market moves in our favor, we're going to take something home no matter what. 
And this example, the stop loss is placed in front of the entry point once price moves in a favorable direction. Okay, we're in front of the entry point rather than behind it. So if we're short, the stop loss is placed below the entry. If I'm long, the stop loss is placed above the entry. Okay, this protects a winning trade from quick price reversals. The hardest thing to face in trading is when price moves up in your favor and then it just automatically turns against you and it sits below but doesn't really hit your stop loss. It's not going for it, but it's just kind of dragging you out in the trade. Those are the worst trades to sit through. Having your stop loss in this area kind of helps you avoid that very bad day in trading. Also, it produces small wins if the stop loss is hit, but you don't take a loss. And it allows the trader to re-enter at an optimal position. It allows you to reset with the win under your belt rather than a loss. Stop loss will most likely be out of the line of fire from normal institutional targets. We know that they're aiming for the highs and the lows in price, so don't put it there and you'll be out of the line of fire. Now, this does take a lot of practice to master, but once you get the hang of it, and once you're starting to enter in on price movements that are beneficial to you, this is the best way to place a stop loss, in my opinion, because you'll literally set yourself up to never lose a trade, all right, if you're able to do this on a consistent basis. Now, here's an example of what we're talking about. Let's say, for example, you have this movement in price here, all right? And you place a trade entry going long at this point. The normal way to place a stop loss will be below those lows, right? So we're long. We think that price is going to keep going up and we'll only give up that amount of, uh, you know, our trade before we say, you know what? We've had enough. It's time to get out. So that's our protective stop loss. But there's another way. We can set a one lock stop loss as well. Okay. So take that last candle there. And what we're saying is that price moved up there. Okay. And we set the one lock stop loss right there and our protective stop loss right there. All it's going to take is for price to start to move a little bit. And you'll notice that both stops get hit. But notice what you're going to get from this price action. Okay. Now, in all reality, we wouldn't place a stop loss on price movement until it did give us some positive price movement, right? So ultimately we're gonna be waiting a bit to place that stop. But let's say for example, that's all you had and boom, you place your stop losses there. Look at what happens. The first thing that you need to recognize is that the one lock stop loss got hit first, but we took home something, right? We were long from that entry point to the long that we were up on, price came right back down and stopped us out. but we didn't sit through the rest of that sideways price action and we definitely didn't lose anything because you can also notice that the protective stop loss got hit as well. What would you rather do? Take a small win or produce a loss? Because ultimately the outcome of this particular movement in price and whether or not you win one or loss leads to the outcome of the next trade. So the winning trader they're in a position to strike again with a win, a little bit more compound interest to add to that next trade. The losing trader is actually discouraged at this point. Why? Because they set the stop loss and their stop loss was set right at the lows of that price action. And look what price does. It just spikes to catch it and then moves up. This is a common scenario. Common, common, common scenario in price. And why do you think it happens this way? For this exact reason, guys. Once you have equal lows set or equal high set, price is going to spike that area to take out those stop losses, then turn right around on you. But for the person who's using that win lock stop loss method, you're already winning a trade. You can come back in with a clear state of mind off of a win and reset just to take advantage of the next opportunity. And probably that spike down to catch that protective stop loss will be the perfect entry area if in fact you were stopped out the first time. You've given price some time to move and give you another area for you to get in at. All right, so just think about this and how this would play out and understand why we're saying that something like a win lock stop loss is a much better method to use when it comes down to actually trading these things, all right, and setting up stop losses. Now, when it comes down to taking profits, you want to make sure that you take home what's yours, which is part of the reason why we say use something like a one lock stop loss instead of a protective stop loss. If you're up in a trade, don't give it back, guys, if you don't need to, right? Taking profit is one of the hardest skills to develop in trading, but it's one of the most vital. 
When you have a trade that's running for you, it's hard for you to get out of that trade, right? You have to develop rules around it. That's the only way you can do it because greed kills profitable trades every single time. So there's a few things that you're going to need to do in order to develop your best practices. You want to find some predetermined levels to exit and follow your rules. Don't go against your rules. These could be equal highs, equal lows, areas of liquidity, areas of imbalance, right? These are places that you want to enter as well as exit trades once it moves in your direction. Just following simple rules like this will allow you to take profit on a pretty regular basis, right? Scale out of positions, leave a little bit in for a potential runner if the market is in fact moving in that way, right? Best way to go when it comes to taking profit. If you find yourself trying to squeeze a little bit more out of the trade, get out of that trade. <laughs> That's the reality of it, all right? So let's break it down. You will receive wins, you will receive losses once you step into this arena. Most traders, they're going to lose before they win, but quitting is the only way that you'll guarantee yourself being a losing trader. They always say it all the time, right? The only way you lose is if you sell. Well, in all reality, the only way you lose in this game is if you quit. You can make bad trades, you can take major losses, but if you quit, then you end up a losing trader. At the end of the day, if you know how to reset yourself and come back and bounce back, then you can turn that losing trader mentality into a winning trader mentality. And hopefully you guys are getting some insight as to how to do that. Don't let emotions drive your decisions. Just don't do it. Whether you're winning or losing, you don't want to get caught up in your emotions. If you do go on a losing streak, reduce your risk until you're able to start winning. Reduce your leverage. Reduce your time spent on these charts and in the market. Get away from it. It will help you when you come back to it. If you go on a winning streak, control your greed by limiting your trades and maintaining your risk profile. Don't get over excited, right? Don't get over aggressive. That's the easiest way for you to start to fail in trading. Compound interest is what grows accounts, not higher leverage. Some people would argue with that, right? Some people would say, nope, leverage is the way to go. Compounding is stupid. They have an argument, right? But in my opinion, I think that Using compound interest, you know, using your winnings to maintain your winnings is the best way to go. Not just adding more leverage, trying to win it all in one big shot. That's how most traders get wrecked. When it comes down to it, mastering the trade, what are our key takeaways? You want to make sure that you're ready before you start. And you want to start slow. Don't jump into the market head first, trying to be an acrobat. You may not be trained well enough, you know, in order to make those type of moves. So make sure that you're starting off slow and you're finding the right perspective before you start to take trades. Find a trusted exchange with lots of users, lots of liquidity. The more liquidity and users on the exchange, the better. Diversify based on your trading requirements. Are you scalping? Are you leverage trading? Are you spot trading? Are you long-term hodling? Base your decision on your exchange, on your trading style, and it's a lot easier for you to manage things that way as well. You wanna keep an active journal. Make sure you're keeping track of what you're doing in this market. You wanna learn how to utilize market orders versus limit orders, the difference between the two, right? We showed you some of that. Also, trade management, it's all about controlling your emotions, all about controlling your impulses. You wanna use strategic stop losses the way that we showed you guys how to place them. Again, it's gonna take some practice for that, right? But if you get good at that, then you're really not taking any real losses in this market of any substantial means. And if you're able to maintain your profit and your account, then you will live to trade another day, no matter what. Also, you wanna make sure that you're taking profits often. So hopefully this information has been helpful for you. It is giving you guys some insight as to how to be a better crypto trader. This was our fourth installment. The last installment is going to be building your portfolio, which is the last video. All right, so hopefully you guys have been following along with this. We'll be dropping that video soon. It's your boy Maestro. If you have any questions, comments, please go ahead and leave them in the comment section and we'll respond to them. Please like, subscribe, share, click the bell notification. Follow us on social media that you'll see to the right. It's your boy Maestro. It's the long and short. We're out of here. Peace.